My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that I give them in a shade. Like, oh, here we go, Mark. <laughs> Off again it's with your... Mark being Mark again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about podcasts is when you're on the air, and it's like therapy, you know? If I can't talk to my family about this stuff, I'll talk to you, Matt, and all our listeners. You know, just tell your whole podcast. Yeah. So who are we talking about today, Matt? huge in the realm of tech and everything as well which is fun so it's kind of this weird mix between modern business tech stuff like silicon valley like la kind of stuff or california kind of stuff and like weird medieval market town which is just a really nice vibe in between the two so huh. it's a yeah. fun experience <laughs> well and i was curious you know what makes estonia the place for this headquarters uh, um, is it like a, is estonia like the you know sedona uh, of Europe, basically, yeah, it's, it, it's basically the Silicon Valley of Europe. So it, it's the place uh, where all the tech companies are in Europe. Right. So if, if there's any kind of technology, any data science, any kind of general business stuff, it, it's the business capital of Europe, effectively. Mm. Um, but a lot of the founders and everyone they're into their tech and everything. It's all like data science and stuff, which is always it's incredibly interesting. It's like the heartland of AI in Europe. Everything is all kind of cool. Um, yeah, so well, I think it's, that's it's why interesting. They chose it, but the main headquarters is there. It's interesting that people here on this side, you know, tend to look at Europe like, oh, connecting with our roots, getting back to the ancestors, the traditional mm. magic ways, and of course, there's truth there. And then people in Europe, they're looking at what America's doing, and they're like, oh, the new age, channeling, mm. you know, all these, like, Ameri really American-centric new age spiritual yeah. ideas. It's funny to see how the, the cultural crossover occurs like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because, uh, like... The first thing that I got, like the first thing that always hits me when I got to Estonia is that it is a very kind of traditional country, and obviously we have the war in, in Ukraine going on at the moment, and Estonia is on the border with Russia. Uh, so one of the first things you notice when you first sort of get into Tallinn is there is a lot of sort of anti-war, you know, memorials, a lot of like posters, that kind of thing. Um, but other than that, it, it is a very kind of traditional country. You know, it's also one of those um, it's one of those weird things because because a lot of it was occupied by the Soviet Union. Uh, for the past all 20, 30 years, they don't have a strongish sense of their own spirituality or their own sort of religious practice. Uh, uh, in fact, a lot of Estonians are actually quite atheistic, uh, although there are quite a lot of churches and there are a lot of old churches, but no one really goes to them too much. It's really interesting. Um, but the Estonia holds the record in Europe for the, pop well, the highest amount of population that believes trees have souls, uh, which I think is quite a funny one. Wow. Um, and... <laughs> As weird as it sounds, I mean, probably not as weird considering this is a kind of a podcast for metaphysics and stuff like that, but in general, but Estonia is also one of those countries where the it, it has one of the highest planted trees, uh, or like, you know, the tree percentages in Europe. It has like, I think, 51 or 55% of the entire landscape is trees. Like, so they, wow. they have like a whole planting initiative. So the air is super clean. It's also on the North Baltic Sea. Um, so you get this whole beautiful updraft of like Baltic Sea Air, which is great. Uh, but there is something about the greenery here that does have a noticeable feel to it. You know, like it does feel noticeably different. Um, and like I, that's coming from me, who you know, growing up in England, like we are. You know, I grew up in Kent, which is the Garden of England, which has like trees everywhere. Mm. But like there is a different, there is a different kind of spirit, a different kind of souls of these kind of trees. It's really, it's a really interesting feeling. Um, 
Well, I love it. Like I, I love being here. And I, I'm again, I my, my background for any of this, I was in archaeology, so or I was an archaeologist for four or five years. Um, so seeing a whole medieval town and everything is like right up my alley anyway. So it's great. Wonderful. Well, we're right off and running to the races here. I love it. I hit record yeah. because what you're talking about was so fascinating. Um, but Chris, welcome to the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. You have your own okay. podcast called Into the Cauldron. And uh, my girlfriend Tara introduced us. She said, hey, you really got to talk to this guy. And uh, here we are. I'm glad to have you. It turns out it's good timing. I'm yeah. in, you know, interested to know more about Estonia, but I won't. we won't spend too much time on that right now. Tell me about yourself and where you, you know, got into this exactly. Because you said just before that you spent some time as an archaeologist. Now mm -hmm. it seems like you're, you know, broadening into a perspective shift in some ways where now you're your own boss in some ways too, right? You're kind of taking the, taking the lead, which is exciting mm -hmm. and awesome. The same thing that I did with my podcast and it's worked out really well. And mm -hmm. obviously you're incorporating your knowledge of hermeticism, uh, the occult. So when did this all begin for you, Chris? Well, so if we, if we back up a little bit, uh, and if you sort of get, get into my general background. So I, well, my, my sort of general uh, space of being or my general sort of life path for a very long time was as an archaeologist. I, I originally graduated uh, back in 2019 uh, and I spent sort of four, uh, four or five years in, in London, uh, initially getting my degree in archaeology uh, and then I graduated and I spent some time working in commercial archaeology uh, and a lot of kind of other things. But I worked at the British Museum for a little while and some other archival places like that. Um, but I predominantly specialized in Near Eastern archaeology. So I, I mostly looked, well, it's kind of a weird story, actually. I, I initially started out in Egypt, which I think most people who are generally interested in spirituality or magic or metaphysics generally do. Um, and I sort of specialized in that for my first two years, got to about my third year halfway through, and I ended up kind of falling in love with what is the, all the period now, the, all the, 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 the geographical region, which is called the Levant, which is basically kind of modern day Syria, Israel, Palestine, that kind of area, Jordan. Um, and I ended up doing my, my thesis originally on uh, the early, or the cultic scene of the early Bronze Age in the Southern Levant, which is if you look, if you imagine where sort of Israel, Palestine, Jordan is, or that Southern area just next to Egypt, uh, I focused a lot of my research initially on Sort of the initial cultic scene there like what the religious practices were the magical practices were uh reconstructing any of that sort of pre we say pre yahwistic so your pre yahweh kind of theology and the religion like the pagan religion effectively of southern levant in the early bronze age uh which was amazing it was really fun uh i excavated out there for two seasons i was excavating at a place called helan jezreel which is in uh it, it's just on the border of syria uh, which is really, really great. Also, it's sort of a little, a few kilometers south of the border of Syria, really. Um, but I, I excavated there for, for two years. I, I actually led a, I led a trench there in my second year because I, I went back for two seasons. Uh, and then I sort of came out of archaeology after having worked there in commercial archaeology, also having come back, uh, having worked in, in, in that. And I, I excavated in some sites around England. I excavated it on a site in Wales, which, uh, or in the Priscelli Hills, which was very, which actually ended up becoming kind of famous. It, there was a documentary made about it, because uh, we ended up kind of finding like a second Stonehenge kind of deal. It's a very long story. Um, it's very, very exciting. Uh, but I, I excavated on a couple of those sites. Uh, then I went into commercial archaeology for a little bit. And then I had a huge kind of paradigm shift or a huge kind of interesting sh like general shift of, of intellect or general shift of meaning where i mean i had always kind of specialized in in the archaeology of ritual especially that, that's what i was looking at so i was looking at how we study ancient magic or, or ancient belief systems uh, and and reconstructing them especially from a what we call a phenomenological standpoint so what does it mean you know when we're the subjective experience of, of ritual or magic in the ancient world. You know, somebody who is a priest or a magician or a mystic or a prophet, whatever it is, what actual experiences were they having? You know, what, what techniques were they using? Whether they, were they getting into altered states of consciousness? Were they using entheogens or psychedelics? You know, any of these kinds of things. I was, I was reconstructing that kind of tradition. Uh, and that inevitably led me into looking at the period that is now known as, as late antiquity, which is more or less a period from 
sort of the late third century up until about the sixth, seventh century. Uh, and that is a really fascinating period for human history with us in general, because it's the period that we get a lot of the traditions that we now sort of group in under, under sort of the Western mystery tradition in general. So things like Hermeticism, Gnosticism, uh, any of these, al alchemy kind of emerges in this kind of similar time period as well. Uh, in, in various different capacities and different areas, what kind of thing. Um, and I ended up just because of my love of Egypt and because I started out originally in Egypt, I think it was inevitable that I kind of fell into Hermeticism. Uh, and I got quite obsessed with Hermeticism and Gnosticism to a lesser extent, but the Gnostics are kind of weird. Um, but it was mainly Hermeticism and Neoplatonism uh, that I, I got quite established with. Uh, and I, I sort of shifted a lot of my scholarly attention towards looking at those two currents predominantly. So a lot of my work was focused around Hermeticism and, and Neoplatonism. Um, and I started doing that. And then during all of that was, you know, two years ago, three years ago, uh, sort of time. And uh, around that sort of general time, I then started jumping around from sort of YouTube company to YouTube company or sort of online general journal journals or anything like that, writing general kind of metaphysical spiritual content. It's one of those things like ghost, I sort of ghost wrote a lot of stuff for a lot of other companies. So I'm one of those people who has probably written something you've seen. You just, like my name isn't attached to it, so you don't know it's by me. <laughs> you know, because I wrote for some of the bigger companies, a couple of the ones that had, you know, 2 million subscribers, 3 million subscribers uh, on YouTube. Um, and eventually I kind of went my own way. I ended up founding my whole, my, my own platform because uh, it has always been, uh, an, an issue for me, the, the inaccessibility of good sources, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy for people sort of in academia to fight back at sort of the public and critique people like Graham Hancock or any other kind of other kind of major pseudo archaeologists who are out there purveying in, in information to the public and people be like, oh, well, the public's kind of stupid because they just eat it all up. It's like, well, it's not really true because the public don't have a massive amount of access to good sources, right? And if they do, you know, you go to Nature, you go to any of the good journals, whatever, you have to pay a, a monthly subscription. It's quite hefty. Um, so it was always a, a bit of a, a pet peeve for me with academia where a lot of it is locked behind paywalls. You know, like there, there is a very kind of elitist culture in academia, which is very healthy, I don't think. Um, I generally take the opinion that there should be no distinction between academic writing and accessible writing. I think people, I think we should be able to exchange sources quite freely. And I'm, I'm a big believer in open science, um, which is, you know, having, making your research available for people essentially. Um, and what inevitably happened with that is I, I kind of channel all of that into making my own platform. It's effectively my own school uh, where I am teaching historical philosophy, historical spirituality, and, and historical magic, effectively. I, I'm looking at systems like Hermeticism and Gnosticism, and to a lesser extent, things like the, the PGM, so the Greek Magical Papyri, uh, and I am working to reconstruct those practices uh, and then teach people sort of that general worldview and how to actually put these things into practice to achieve lots of different things, you know, whether it's communication with, with spirits and deities or... Uh, altered states of consciousness and theophanies or, or general kind of self-development. Um, and it was one of those other weird things where because I've done a lot of things, that desire for sort of personal transformation and self-development inevitably led me to where I am right now, which is kind of Tallinn and Estonia, uh, it, which inevitably basically just meant that I ended up qualifying as a coach um, because I, I realized that I guess I was teaching a lot of things, but a lot of my, my students were coming to me having issues in their life and they were needing more sort of one-to-one -one tuition you know or they were needing more one-to-one -one guidance a lot of the time uh and inevitably you know when you're on social media when you're doing podcasts when you're doing this kind of thing it is kind of a business unto itself right you are well, like you are you you are your own brand effectively you know and you need to learn to market yourself otherwise you don't make a dent so i was like okay i'm, I'm gonna go qualify as a business coach so i'm gonna i'm gonna learn how to do business you know, like I'm going to go in, I'm going to learn all this kind of stuff, and then I'm just going to kind of apply it to everything I'm doing and start scaling and start doing all this kind of thing. And I've had some pretty good growth with it. Um, I, I, I only recently started a YouTube channel. I'm kind of getting into that medium now. Um, and I started my podcast about a year ago. Uh, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of people in the occult community, which are is, is very, very fun. Uh, I love doing interviews with people like this. Uh, like this. Um, 
just generally sharing stuff but it's yeah it's a fascinating journey because i i've kind of i've gone from teaching all this kind of stuff into qualifying as a business coach so i can consult companies and things like that so i know how to scale business uh and and anything like that but then also i'm, I'm still teaching what i love which is is historical spirituality right it's ancient spirituality uh and i i definitely have a, a soft spot for hermeticism absolutely it's kind of it's, it's where my wheelhouse is really <laughs> Yeah, and I have been tuning into your podcast, Into the Cauldron, on a more recent, I think the, the latest episode with Rufus. Uh, you mm. mentioned something that I want to bring up and have you clarify and maybe share your thoughts, expand a little bit. You mentioned, or maybe Rufus mentioned this, I, I can't be too sure, uh, but you both commented on the fact that when you get into ceremonial magic, whatever iteration of it, you sort of have these like naive, silly hopes and dreams, you know, that kind of push you into drama that then molds you based on the choices you make, right? So people go into it with this notion that, oh, I'm going to do a spell and then I'm going to get the girl of my dreams. And that happens, but it, it ends up being more of a quest than, you know, a genie in a bottle just granting your wish, right? And I wonder, do you think that, people are just stagnant and our society has left people kind of frozen without a clear path on how to achieve these things that are really innate and human because we've been given this sort of, Oh, we got to go to work. You got to make this money. You got to do this. You know, a, a lot of what it means to be human has kind of been left up to our own devices and people feel un unsure on where to go. Do you think that's partly why, you know, magic is so appealing and even effective for a lot of people yeah i think it's a complicated question because I, I i have two conflicting opinions on it for the most part on the one hand it, when, when we when we look at magic historically especially if we look at the ceremonial grimoires for example so anything from the medieval period and the renaissance but also to a certain extent even the pgm right so the greek magical inquiry back in in the early early first second century or however you know that period uh which is where i look at things the goals of magic have always been very mundane right? ironically it's, it's something that people it, it's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around but a lot of the goals of, of at least the ceremonial tradition it's not you know it, it, it's not this kind of pop culture spirituality it's all about oh ascension transcending the body doing this kind of thing that's not magic that's something that's a different thing and right? it's very kind of 60s 70s 80s kind of stuff right um there were, there were some traditions in that some like theurgy although theurgy isn't magic it's an entirely different i would I identify that more as ritualized philosophy um but magic since since the pgm and, and the majority of the ceremonial stuff is descended largely from the pgm that's the origin of the ceremonial tradition um it mostly or most of the time if not all the time it has very mundane goals right the, the goals of magic are very much about securing yourself in this life right it's it's things like protecting yourself from thieves it's it's getting a new partner bringing a woman to you usually um although actually i'll say saying that uh while that's definitely the case in the later grimoires from the medieval period in the renaissance uh we have just as many accounts in the pgm of women performing love spells on men and also men performing love spells on other men as well ancient greece was a very kind of liberal culture in that kind of way and women performing cells on other women um so it's kind of another thing people like to kind of retro like oh the patriarchy in the ancient world it was very horrible it's like mm, it's not what the texts say uh so i hate to break it to you um but a lot again a lot of the stuff is again it, it's finding a new partner it's 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 you know securing lost property it's doing this kind of general thing right so the, the goals of magic have always been very mundane um but i think part of the problem is 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 it, it really lies in how we define magic you know it, it, it lies in, in, in what exactly it is and the problem that we have with it is that magic as a technology and i i largely do believe magic is technology i i i'm very much kind of the persuasion that sorcery magic whatever you want to call it although they are kind of different things they're subsets of each other uh i think it is a technology and i i when i say technology the, uh, I say it because the the magic or magia in ancient Greek it was classified as a techne, and techne in, in ancient Greek it it basically means any kind of discipline or field of study that was believed to have a learnable set of principles. 
that if you apply it, then a certain result happens. And that's how the Greeks sort of conceptualize magic. It's always, it always kind of very clearly goes back to Egypt. The Greeks love the Egyptians. They even think the source of magic is Egypt itself. And, and we have a reason for that in the Asclepius, which is one of the Hermetic texts. Um, or in, in Greek, it's known as the Logos Telios, the perfect discourse. Uh, and they, in that, they say that Egypt is supposedly, uh, it, it's the temple of the world, effectively. It's the place that is chosen by the gods. Uh, and the people living there, therefore, have a responsibility to continually upkeep the gods, you know. Um, but magic in that era is a very different to what we would dub as magic today, right? Because you look at magic today, it's all kind of, it's merged with weird new age practices. So when you talk about magic, you feel like, oh, well, energy work, manifestation, all these kinds of things. None of that is really magic, I wouldn't say. Um, I think probably the closest thing to something like modern new age manifestation would probably be something like chaos magic, or it's a type of chaos magic. Um, but even then, there's, there, there's no real you know, basis uh, to the whole thing. And I think one of the biggest problems that we have with this kind of thing is that, as you were saying here, there, there really does seem to be a lack of progression. Um, and part of the reason why is... is People are taking such an eclectic approach to their practices nowadays that traditionalism is 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 kind of going to the wayside, and what it basically means is progressionism is effectively dead. You know, when you in the ancient world, if you were learning magic, right? If you were going to learn magic, it would have been probably on a one-to-one -one basis. But it's very rare if any of the wearing the actual schools of magic. I am a very big um critic of the term mystery school i think it, it's absolutely ridiculous um from a historical standpoint the mystery cults of eleusis samothrace uh the mithraic mysteries whatever they were not schools um it, it, it gives the wrong impression to call them schools uh when we think when we when we call it a school it implies that there are or there is a teacher there is students there is some kind of form of curriculum that we are learning from that is not what happened at all um there may have been, you know, off the books individual tutoring. If someone was trained to be a hierophant or a high priestess or whatever, that that's a bit of a different story. Um, but as, as far as the mystery cults go, whatever, it, it was very much, you know, it, it's a ritual performed for the benefit of the congregation or performed on you. It's, it's not something that you're taught to do. Only the hierophant would know the the inner mysteries, whatever it was, right? Um, but you were, you know, if you were learning magic in this kind of way, it was very much on kind of an apprentice master relationship, right? It was very individual, very, very personal. Uh, but you situate yourself within a tradition. And when you do, that gives you a set of rites of passage. It gives you a set of milestones, gives you a set of texts to read in a certain order and tells you what to do. And the biggest thing is you have a sense of community, right? Magicians in the ancient world, if you, if you, if they were, priests, for example, as most Egyptian priests also doubled as magicians, especially as the temples start to close, uh, they had a sense of community, they had a sense of progression. And we don't really have that anymore, because there are, are generally sort of what we can dub as, as three distinct ways of interacting with, with spirits, or interacting with the divine in any kind of capacity. Um, there is religion, which is, is kind of the exoteric form of interaction, uh, which is, is mostly for the benefit of the whole congregation, it's benefit or benefit for the whole society. Uh, and generally, you will have kind of built up myths or characters or whatever it is. Uh, and Plato and Socrates, both of those philosophers, or a lot of the early Greek uh, philosophers, they are very critical of those myths. They actually, they, in fact, Plato is even quoted, I think, in the Republic and in the Timaeus. Uh, of saying that the gods that we know of in ancient Greece are actually like their secondary gods, their lesser gods in comparison to the higher one, which is the true intellect, right? Or the true like consciousness of the whole reality. Uh, or they were created secondly. Um, and we have we have these stories which deals with the exoteric nature. Uh, you would then have had the mysteries or the mystery cults, which are essentially the, the esoteric dimension of a religion. You know, so if we take something like Eleusis, it, it, it's, it was dedicated to predominantly uh, Persephone or Kore uh, and Demeter. Um, there is some it's, uh, some possible links to like a, a, a Mycenaean era, so like a pre pre Greek Dark Age cult where where Poseidon was also involved. As Poseidon had the Earth Shake, or Poseidon was the original king before Zeus, uh, and that's based on some evidence we have from Arcadian cults. So there are some cults in Arcadia that, that bear that. Um, 
but it, it talks about like kind of a different theology for example if you look at something like the orphic mysteries so the, the mysteries that are attributed to orpheus uh they have a very interesting theology in that zeus is kind of considered to be a, a demiurge figure who ends up kind of reforming the world after chronos all sort of chronos and, and all the titans initially form the world they then give birth to the gods and then zeus kind of takes on this role of the demiurge in the orphic mysteries and then ends up reforming uh, the universe into the one that we have now. So our universe is kind of a second or third universe because Zeus recreated it as the demiurge. And that's very awful. It's very strange. Um, and that then the entire the entire universe and our entire um, progression as human beings is effectively Zeus self actualizing. Right, it's Zeus learning himself through the universe that he's created, and then all of us are part of it. You know, it's very it's very interesting. Uh, it's not like any of the other sort of general mysteries or any, any of the other mystery cults. But my point is, to, to loop this back around to your original question, we don't really have that sense of progression anymore because we have religion there, which is that thing, mysteries, which is the inner dimension of religion, which is basically gone. Now, there are no mystery cults left. The closest thing would probably be something like modern Freemasonry or, or some of the, like, the Rosicrucian system, which is like self-initiation. Um, and then, of course, there's magic. And magic is, is your is your your personal relationship with these spirits, right? And there does there's been a lot of work, especially in the case of PGM, where it, it seems like a lot of the, the general ritual procedures, while they may be following some religious outlines, a lot of the kind of formalities are relaxed in favor of a more personal relationship with the deity, right? You're using different names, which again, names carry power. Uh, the ones that aren't used in, in, in public, you know, you're, you're using specific um, substances, different things that relate to the deity to call them in, and that kind of thing. But it's a very personal endeavor. Um, by the way, it gives us a sense of progression, and we just don't have that anymore. And I think as, as a part of that, magic or modern magic has kind of lost its soul. To a certain extent and while that, that might sound a bit dramatic um you know there does there does seem to be something missing because when you look at all of these ceremonial procedures you know or if you look at the Avramelin ritual for example but I'm on, uh, on worms he talks about uh, uh, at one point with the guidance of his his holy guardian angel whatever he like stretches out his hand and a tree withers in front of him you know all these kinds of things all, all the the renaissance magicians the medieval magicians who are doing things like the goetia or any of, this, any of the ceremonial procedures they seem to be describing very physical entities you know very physical things that they are are physically seeing and they they can to, to the extent that they can give very detailed descriptions of these things like as as clear as i'm seeing you right now you're seeing me right compare that to, to what we have in modern magic you know what we have in modern kind of general magical spiritual practice in general um it's one of the things that's continually annoying me because i see it on you know the goetia fanboy forums all the time where people are like oh, oh my god the candle flickered once my incense like wafted slightly therefore the demon is here it's like something doesn't add up there for me you know, like look at look at what they're describing in, in, in these grimoires versus what you're saying is happening, right? There's that we're missing something in here. Uh, and I think a large part of it comes down to worldview, honestly. Our worldview ultimately determines our reality. Um, and something like magic and to a certain extent astrology, because like to some extent, and some people may disagree with me on this, I don't think we can really be practicing magic if we aren't also having a discussion about astrology. Um, because I think, especially if you're into the whole ceremonial tradition, ceremonial magic and the grimoires is basically just watered down astrological magic. You know, if you look at something like the Picatrix, or you look at any of the, the older kind of astrological grimoires, it's much more like astrological magic is a kind of ceremonial magic, but it is the highest form, it is the most complicated form of ceremonial magic. Um, and when you understand something like the Picatrix, or if you read any of the Arab philosophers, Al-Kindi, Al-Biruni, anyone like that, there, or especially like Thibit, um, Thabit ibn Karab, who uh, was the, the highest astrologer of the Sabians, who is like, they are the best astrologers and Iranian, uh, Iranian astrologers in the ancient world. Um, read any of that kind of stuff, and then read the grimoires, and you will see how much of like, how much watered down it's become you know like astrological stuff is like the gold standard and then it kind of gets into the grimoire tradition and it's just kind of yeah it's a bit in it um and it, it's one of those weird things i i started in the grimoire tradition i love the grimoire tradition it's really interesting as as i've kind of matured in my own magical practice i have become more of an astrological magician so now i, I mainly make talismans or do planetary work or i work with planetary spirits 
uh, more so than the Croatia or anything like that. I'm kind of a, a pretty big critic of the Croatia, which has almost got me cancelled a couple of times, so ironically. <laughs> um, but it's it's an interesting thing. But either way, um, yeah, I, I think modern magic has kind of lost its soul. Uh, and I, again, I think the reason being is, is that we don't have the same worldview that these people did. You know, magic and astrology, to a certain extent, it relies on the pre-modern worldview, which is you need to know about the active intellect, you need to know about the world soul, you need to know about the divine forms in Plato's in Plato's analogy, all that kind of thing, because they they are the mechanisms through which magic works. Right. You know, they are they are the ways how we can actually define how it's working, and we don't have that in the modern world. So we we tend to try and you know equate. How magic works to a materialist paradigm because the the, the modern western world is inherently atheist atheist materialist that that's the underlying philosophy of everything now the problem you have with that of course is that that underlying philosophy basically means that everything results from matter right all consciousness results from matter and matter and energy are the same thing thanks to einstein you know the field equations e equals mc squared right there's a matter a matter energy equivalency um problem you have with that is it's in, it makes things inherently devoid of meaning and purpose, and it inevitably tends towards nihilism, and it makes everyone depressed. And that's why we're having a huge mental health crisis, right? Because the world view doesn't really work. But you can't practice magic, at least if you're going down the traditional sense, you can't practice it in the modern worldview. It's it's in the astrology and magic is incompatible with a modern worldview. Um, of sort of atheistic materialist science, where you try and equate everything to oh well. Um, energy where everything's coming from matter you know no when you're doing ancient magic you're doing astrological magic things have a certain level of correspondence you know there there is a thing and they correspond to ideas they correspond to things in the world soul uh, and and when you arrange certain things in a certain way at certain times then it creates corresponding effects in the world soul which inherently then creates other effects astrologically which then eventually manifests physically you know, or approve this kind of sympathy and correspondence. Um, but none of that is discussed in, in, in modern spiritual practice, you know. And I think that's a large part of the reason why people find it so interesting, absolutely, but there is a very big lack of sort of the, the, the transfer of information. You know, people will, but they'll, they'll find it interesting, and then the second that, it starts to contradict that material worldview that we unconsciously have as a bias, people turn off. Mm-hmm. You know, the second we try and say, okay, well, actually, magic maybe isn't working with our worldview. There's no logical way to explain things. And people can, on the surface, they can be very kind of odd and be like, oh, well, I'm very spiritual. So it doesn't matter to me. I'm not in this modern worldview. If you have grown up in the Western world, you have this worldview, whether you're aware of it or not. And if you're unaware of it, that's more of a problem. Right, if it's up because it's working through you unconsciously, so you need um, you need to spend time actively sitting with your own worldview and how you think the world works and begin to unpack that a little bit before you can really start to understand how magic works. But then when, once you do, then you can find that like your, your practice will really skyrocket and it will really start working. And then like you're like, oh, I, I yeah, I, I understand how this works now. You know, like you can start seeing synchronicities and start seeing things align and all that kind of thing. So. Absolutely. It's an interesting <laughs> Yeah, well, I had two questions, and you just sort of answered them with that last part there. And I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to the art of performing these rituals in the correct corresponding windows of time that, you know, match the effect, the desired result, you know, it almost seems like achieving that is such a feat that if you could, it, you know, I don't remember the old adage, but if you can do that, you can do anything sort of, you know, right? It's almost like a test of the human consciousness baked into uh, our our soul in a way, right? I mean... To, yeah, I, I think it's a kind of self, like I, I would argue definitely it's a kind of self-initiation, mm. you know? The, the ability for you, like it, it, there's no two ways about it. If you want to be a practicing magician, you have to be a scholar. Mm. Right, you have you have to be able to research and be able to do good research. Right. Um, if you like, as, as cynical as it sounds, you're not going to get impactful magical practice from scrolling Instagram, right? right? right. From, from scrolling that kind of shit or looking at 
you know, random things on YouTube, whatever it is. Like some, again, some YouTube is different. It's very good, but you're like, like in general, you're not going to get, you know, those powerful, I don't know, oh shit moments in magic that everyone's ultimately searching for. If you're being honest, right. We want to be able, we want to be awestruck with something we want. We want to have an experience where like, oh, like I have no idea how I can explain that. Like that's genuinely something else. You're not going to get those experiences unless you're willing to dive deep into it. You know, unless you're willing to put the time and the effort in to really do the research and figure out how the stuff works. Um, if you're not willing to do that, then you're not ready to be a magician. Hmm. You know, like you're, you're not, you're not, if you're not willing to do the research and put the time in to understand how the system works, then you're not going to get very far. Right. You know, it's a, and, it, and this, is, this is true historically. Every magician that we know historically was an active scholar, right? You go back to the Renaissance, you go back to the medieval period. These people, you know, someone like Marsilio Ficino, for example, so the guy who translated the Corpus Metricum, he translated Plato at the same time. He was a genius. He was a polymath, right? He, he graduated top of his class at a lot of universities. You know, he did a lot of interesting stuff, um, but he was fundamentally a scholar. First and foremost, there is no real distinction between sort of scholarship and occultism in the ancient world because sort of astrology was part of the university curriculum, you know? So it, it was a thing that everyone kind of knew how to do and you have to learn how to do it. Um, and it's, I suppose you can draw a parallel because again, I, I, I'm talking about ceremonial magic quite fiercely here, you know, and that's not the only, that's not the only type of magic, right? So, and this is where the, the definition kind of comes in of how exactly we're defining magic. Um, if you were to sort of take an ancient definition of it, or you were try, to try and use a, use a definition that made sense to, I don't know, an, an, an ancient person, an ancient magician, it would be, you, you have to include spirits, right? Essentially, like this, the simplest way of explaining it would be that magic is, is the ability to create change uh, through the agency of spirits or through the agency of spiritual allies. Um, and those spirits are persuaded or forced or coerced to, to, to work with you or to create the desired effect through the use of what we call sutenomata in Greek, which is, is correspondence or sympathy. Um, and sympathy is not, you know, being sorry for you in a sense. It's sympathy in, in the sense of, of correspondences. Things are sympathetic with each other. So a spirit, you know, let's say you sort of have your, again, looping the astrology, you have your general sort of plant, a planetary sphere, right? Seven planetary spheres, Mer Mercury to Saturn, whatever it is, right? Um, and each of those planets will contain a divine idea, right? And this is where the, the traditional worldview comes in, which is kind of what you need to unpack magic. The best person to look at this kind of thing, I think, who synthesizes it very well, is Agrippa. So Cornelius Agrippa, he is a Renaissance uh, magician. He writes the three books of cult philosophy. They are foundational texts to anyone practicing magic. You need to read them. Uh, and he does a very, very good job of really simplifying this world. He basically says there are three different kinds of worlds, right? We generally kind of like to think of, oh, well, there's a physical world, there's a spirit world. You know, that, that's kind of the general modern perception of things. He goes, he goes a little bit deeper. He goes, no, there are three worlds. There is all starting from the top, right? Or, or the center, depending on what your cosmology is and how you see things. The Greeks were very vertical. They very clearly believed that there was a vertical hierarchy for you. Um, but he's, he's under the impression, first you have the, the divine world, right? Which is the realm where the angels live or it's the realm where these higher entities live. Uh, and that ultimately is the mind of God. Right, we have sort of God at the center, and God, in a sense, it could be a, it, it can be a literal being, it could be a consciousness, it could be a force. It, it depends what your cosmology is. Um, but you, at the top, you have the mind, essentially the intellect of God, and that is is emanating out the divine ideas. Right. So this is this is textbook Plato. It, it's the theory of forms and ideas. Right. You have the divine mind that is thinking up things. You know, it's thinking ideas. Basically, the, the the simplest example I can say here is like if I was to draw, you know, draw a triangle on the screen or draw a triangle. I have a pen with me, but I can't do it right now. If I was to get a bit of paper, draw a triangle on a page, right? It's not going to be as perfect as the as the triangle I can see in my mind, right? Because the, I, I have the idea or the archetype of a triangle in my mind. But if I was to then get rid of the paper triangle, does that mean that every triangle in the world suddenly disappears? Does the idea of a triangle disappear? No, of course not. So that, so can we say that in that case, do we know that there is an intangible kind of non-material form of that triangle, right? The idea of a triangle that exists, there is a spiritual archetype 
to a triangle. Now imagine that every single thing in the universe is a, is is founded on the same principles. That everything exists as an idea first, an archetype or a spiritual version of itself. And again, we're using the word spiritual. Plato really doesn't even distinguish between that. Uh, he he is the first to distinguish between matter and sort of non-matter. I guess we could say. I mean, even matter isn't really the good word for it because Plato doesn't have any conception of matter. The closest would be soma, which is body. Um, so Plato doesn't have any kind of conception of you know physical stuff that we're seeing here. He calls everything the body because he thinks it's the body of the world soul. Um, so we can't really talk about matter in the context of Plato because it doesn't exist. Uh, but well, he, he does seem to make a distinction between soma and asunomata, which is sort of bodied and uh, unbodied, so immaterial, essentially. Uh, and there is this idea that the forms of the ideas are immaterial. Um, and that's the first layer of reality. The, 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 the heart of reality, you have this kind of divine image, this divine being, this divine force, this thinking ideas of the being. Right. Uh, and those are generally like the, the platonic virtues, things like love, justice, beauty, whatever it is. Right. Then if you sort of go down the hierarchy of being, go down the chain, you come to the celestial world, which is what we now call the astral world. Astral literally just means star. Uh, and in fact, Plato, is, again, is the first one to come up with the term astral body. Um, and it literally means star, star body. Um, and the astral is, is the realm of planets, right? It's from where astrology works. And hence the word astral, astrology, astrologos, literally the speech of the stars. That's really what it means in Greek. Um, and in this kind of capacity or in this world and in, in this celestial world, we have planets. We have the fixed stars, where all the spheres of the planets and the fixed stars. And the planets are not necessarily forces unto themselves, they are the celestial embodiments of the Platonic ideas. So if we imagine that at the heart of reality, we have the idea of, of justice, for example, or, or violence, or whatever, or war, whatever it is, comes up or thinks about, right? That idea is then manifest in the celestial world as Jupiter, for example, because Jupiter embodies justice. In, in Kabbalah, it's chesed, right, which is loving kindness, mercy, whatever it is, right? And Jupiter, therefore, embodies the platonic idea of justice. If we keep following that chain of being down, we then get to the material world. And this is a group of third world, the physical world, the material that we live in right now. And this is kind of the ultimate sort of, you know, mystery of the whole thing. And Agrippa and everyone in the antiquity, for the most part, placed the physical at the bottom, not the top. Now we flip it backwards. We say the physical's right here. You know, so the, in the ancient world, everyone took a spirit first approach or a mental first approach. And this is kind of the weird thing, you know, when you say the word spiritual or the word soul or anything like that, people automatically assume religious, you know, they automatically assume, oh, well, you're talking about, you know, spiritual mumbo jumbo shit, whatever it is, right? doesn't really work when you think about it, because Plato, again, doesn't make a distinction between the soul and the mind. In fact, if anything, Plato says that the, the mind, the rational mind, is the higher sort of reasoning of the soul. So they're effectively the same thing. In fact, the word that he uses, suke, in Greek, is where we get the word psyche today. And essentially what he is saying about, well, when you, when you read, especially if you read the Timaeus, what he, what he effectively talks about it is it, it's, it's an inner organ of sensory perception. You know, it's our inner self, effectively, what he's, what he's saying. That is, the way he describes it in basically every sense of the word is how modern psychologists describe the mind. He, is, he, he doesn't make a distinction between the mind and soul. You know, so every time that we are talking about the mind, effectively here, we are effectively talking about the soul, right? Whether you're talking about consciousness, awareness, whatever it is, we are addressing the same thing. I think at, on a society-wide level, because we are trying to establish ourselves as an atheistic or mechanistic culture, we all kind of collectively have this weird religious trauma where everyone's kind of like trying to distance themselves from saying, oh, well, I'm not religious, okay, I'm not spiritual. And it's a very kind of weirdly Eurocentric, Western-centric, it's like a weirdly colonial mindset as well. Where it's like, it's it's building with kind of old anthropological models, especially Dachymian models, uh, which are trying to argue that religion is in opposition to science, that science is kind of the emblem of progress, that you know the more rational we become as a species, the more advanced we get. And therefore, religion, magic, spiritual stuff is all kind of remnant of an older age. It's all superstition. The entire point of science is to disprove superstition. So therefore, you know, they're completely different things. 
that has that, that didn't exist pre-enlightenment for like all of human history before the enlightenment there wasn't a distinction you know it's a very modern idea that we're trying to distance ourselves from religion especially um and that's where it's come from you know a lot of this kind of like modern materialist sort of atheistic paradigm of things it's coming as a reaction to religious trauma a lot of it has come from a reaction to the influence that the church had people didn't really like that which is understandable but it, it's you know it's an issue when you're not aware of it you know when, it, when it's again when, when your world is happening unconsciously that's that's when there's an issue because then, then the inherent biases and things um sneak in ultimately um so yeah i, I kind of lost my train of thought remind me where, where, where are we going well we're heading in a, a direction trying to explain essentially, um, you know, why we're in this position of science over religion and, and how it's sort of uh, affected our connection to the soul and our even our understanding of all these things. You know, science has kind of led us to this position of nihilism. Um, if that doesn't remind you, I do have a question, though. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier how the Goetia, you know, you have some issues with it. And I understand. I have some issues with Crowley myself. And uh, he has a, I think he rewrote the Goetia, or at least practiced partly, partly yeah. right? So he's involved with it. I have a copy that has his name on it for some reason. I forget the other gentleman who he published that with, but it was, um, uh, well, it was McGregor Mathers. And that's like, it. Well, part, of the, part of the whole issue with Crowley is that he kind of stole McGregor Mathers' translations and then published them as his own. Right. Um, so Ma McGregor Mathers was the original one to translate it, but Crowley kind of stole Mathers' translations and published them himself. Well, and, uh, and, and Crowley and sits in this time period around the same kind of departure from the old modern you know to this new totally. modern yeah. right where now people are very much about scientism as a for emblem of progress as you say and i wonder where crowley fits into that in his role because you know he has some strange connections to the government allegedly and obviously he wasn't exactly the most moral character so yeah no, i mean so crowley is one of those people like as a like as a magician, I I do quite I like Crowley mm. as a magician. As a man, I think he's a piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, as a man, he's an absolute rat of a person. He 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 did terrible things morally. He's bankrupt. He he used to do. Uh, I mean, I say that you you kind of got to give him credit for how creative he was in his moral bankruptcy. Mm. He uh, he used to do things like he would he would meet with all the the lump, the, the famous London occultists. He'd invite them all out for dinner. Um, and then he would only take $100 bills with him. So when it came time to pay for dinner, like the restaurant can change any of his bills. So all, all his friends would pick up the tab and he would get a free dinner. You know, so like it's that kind of thing where it's like, yes, it's morally kind of bankrupt and shit. But you've kind of got to admire him for his creativity with it, you know, a little bit. It's as, as weird as it is. Um, but as a man, yeah, he's. I don't particularly like him as a human being. I, 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 I've mentioned a couple of my podcasts before, like my biggest critique of Crowley is ultimately that his hedonism was caught in the way of his own true will. Mm. You know, he, he, he has this idea of the true will, right, in the Thelema, which is kind of your, your own kind of higher, uh, well, I, I don't necessarily want to call it your own higher calling, but your highest will, right, the will that is imparted to you by your holy guardian angel. Um, and nothing should get in the way of that. You know, um, and supposedly if you're following Crowley's Thelemic system, when you are in alignment with your true will, you are in alignment with why you are here inherently, uh, and you will notice, or he says, a person in line with their true will, you know, doors open for them. You know, it, it's like they're just kind of breezing through life. It's very simple. Everything's very easy for them because they're acting they're acting in line with their highest will. Um, he did not do that, right? He wrote the system. He philosophized it, which is great. I think he's brilliant for it. But his own sort of his own hedonism and his own he ha like i was on this podcast with stephen skinner a while ago and stephen skinner put this uh really really well he's like he just had Sally was just having too much fun to be a proper magician you know and you have to understand i i would characterize Crowley almost as like a proto troll you know he, he was trolling before it was cool um <laughs> he he knew 100 percent 
the picture that the British tabloids were painting of him. You know, they 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 all painted this image of him being this massive Satanist, that he was the most evil man in the world, that he was, you know, sacrificing children and doing weird sex rituals. Um and regardless of whether he actually was or not, there is no evidence that he ever sacrificed children. Um, but there, you know, regardless of whether he was or not, he knew the stories about him and he catered to them. He would go on, he would deliberately go out and do these interviews. Well, you know, and, and, and that's kind of then that sorry to cut you off, but that's kind of where I was hoping to lead you to with my question mm-hmm. is, you know, because it does seem like Crowley's celebrity occultism influenced what we now consider celebrity uh, and even yeah. the pop occultism, which is like, you know, something you said you took umbrage with. I agree. You know, I, I think it's laughable. Some of the stuff I see on Instagram at other times, oh, yeah. I see things that I'm like, well, bravo, kudos, you know, but yeah. for the most part, it is a lot of like, yeah, clap your finger, your hands together three times in front of a pink candle and you know you're gonna get your your crush is gonna write you a love letter yeah, and it's gonna come like back or put this <laughs> trending sound on a, on a sigil or whatever and it'll right. get something to happen yeah i mean it's one of those weird things because you can't really separate crowd at least at least from the perspective of modern ceremonial magic you can't separate crowley from that system you can't take out you can't take crowley out of wicker even wicker wicker owes and this is even more controversial i would argue wicker owes more to crowley and ceremonial magic than it does to british folklore you know gardner and a lot of the wiccans when they were inventing the planet system they were kind of very big on this like fact thing like oh wicker is the old religion it, it, it's the old british pagan you know folklore druid religion it's like no you read any any of the texts it's very crowleyan it's very sort of ceremonial a lot of the a lot of the spirits and things are all from hebrew and egyptian sources um, they're not British in any kind of capacity, and the, and the things that are British, things like Sanunos, isn't British anyway. Um, Avadi, which is Italian, uh, any of the other kind of general Druidic or Welsh goddesses or anything like that, they all come from sort of 10th, 11th century Welsh poetry, which is which is post Christianization. So they're not authentic paganism, or really, or they're not sort of, I won't say authentic, they're not kind of pure paganism, but they're, they're more sort of Christianized versions of things. Um, but with Crowley, yeah, you you can't take Crowley out of those systems because he he galvanized this whole thing, right? The, the whole reason we, I, I would even argue the entire reason that we know about the Goetia is because of Crowley. He he's the one that pushed it into mainstream, right? Uh, for, for better or for worse, but I don't agree with Crowley's assessment of Croatia. Crowley was under the impression, um, in much the same way as people today are kind of obsessed with quantum stuff, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum physics. Crowley and, and all the magicians of, of his time period, it's all the late, all the early 1900s, psychology was the very new thing. You know, psychology was the in science of the time. So everybody, all the magicians back then were trying to sort of make everything psychological. They were trying to say, they, they, were, they were trying to prove magic through the lens of psychology. In the same way that modern New Age people like Deepak Chopra or whatever are trying to prove spirituality through quantum physics. Everything works in cycles, exactly the same thing. Uh, and Crowley, well, he's very famous in his, his perception of the Gracia for saying that, you know, the 72 Goetic demons, they correspond to 72 different parts of the brain, you know, and when you're working with them, it activates a different center of your brain or whatever. No, absolutely not. There, there is nothing in, in traditional sources. That's that like, uh, form. that's like hack phrenology, right? That old sign, yeah. like it's essentially yeah. phrenology applied to, yeah, that's silly. Wow. It's, it's very, <laughs> it's very strange. Um, and you know, I, I can understand it. He, he was, again, he was trying to prove magic through the, like the in science of his day. It's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, Yeah. The Goetia, again, the Goetia, my issue with the Goetia is, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this that won't get me hated on. <laughs> um, the Goetia is kind of a joke, honestly. And I, I, don't, I don't mean that to be derogative. I mean that it literally has its origins in satire. Uh, the, the 72 spirits that we know about in the Goetia, the ultimate source of them, where they come from, is another book, by a guy called Johannes Weyer, who is the uh, the student, effectively, of Agrippa, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Pseudomonarchia de Monorum, The False Monarchy of Demons. Uh, and it's not even really a book. It's an appendix uh, that he adds to another one of his books that he wrote uh, called the, um, the, 
what's it, De Prestegis Magica, which he wrote as a defense of witches in the witch trials. So Weyer is one of the early kind of rationalist psychologists, in, in, in a way I can describe him, where he was one of the first people to say that people who were getting tried in the witch trials, effectively, they rather than having sort of magical abilities or whatever, they could have been mentally ill and they could have been having visions or they could have been schizophrenic or bipolar or whatever it is, or if he didn't have words for them, like words for those conditions. But that's effectively what he was arguing, that people in the witch trials who were undergoing these kinds of things, especially if they were undergoing torture, they were not, they, they weren't evidence of real magic. You know, these people probably had some kind of mental illness and they were being punished for having mental illness. And so instead, rather than torturing them, we should be trying to send them to hospital and get them help or that kind of thing. Um, and as an appendix to that text that he writes in defense of witches, he adds on this little text, the Pseudomonarchy and Demonum, uh, as um, what, where his his exact source for it is, isn't necessarily clear. I think it's probably the Liber Malorum Spiritum, which is the Book of Evil Spirits. Um, but he sort of adds on uh, adds on this sort of little appendix to his text. And the general kind of introduction, or the general kind of vibe of the whole thing, is basically him just sitting there going, huh, look at how stupid all these witches are. These are all the, all the ridiculous spirits they believe in. How stupid is this? You know? And then somebody effectively took that list that he made as a as satire, as a joke, right? And then just turned it into an entire Grimoire tradition, right? They basically they took that entire thing. And it's also distinctly Anglophone. It's very British. It, it doesn't exist. Like the, the Megatron tradition doesn't exist outside of England. Um, and somebody took it and it effectively, they, they ran with it and they sort of developed it into this whole sort of lesser key of Solomon system now where we have sort of the 72 spirits, but the first principal source is Weyer. It's Weyer Pseudomonarchia. And he wrote it purely as satire initially. And it's like, it's the living definition of that meme where it's like, you know, when your satire is so good, it becomes canon. You know, like that that's literally what's happened. Right. Um, wow. And it's just, it's so interesting to me like i don't object to anything in the goetia per se like as far as a magic like as far as a magical system goes like there's there's no if you're only reading the old goetia there's not enough in there anyway to reconstruct it you know you're not you're not going to get enough of a i don't know if you're going by the traditional standards you're not going to be able to get a manifestation using purely the old goetia alone you need to be looking at the other books of the magical the old paulina the old theurgia or the theurgia paulina uh, the Theurgia Goetia, uh, the Ars Armadel, all that kind of thing. The Ars Notoria is is not originally a part of the Magicon. It, it's an entirely separate tradition that is much, much older. It, it's medieval or early medieval angel magic. Um, but I yeah, my my main issue with the Goetia is people think it's something it's not. You know, people are very kind of quick to jump on the bandwagon. And again, it's mostly Crowley. Like people are, we can attribute this to Crowley for the most part. People kind of come in, they're like, oh my God, the Goetia is perfect. You know, the Goetia is this ancient book of evil spirits. I'm going to summon it and I'm going to get my crush to like me or whatever it is. It's like, I hate to break it to people, but if you read like any other ceremonial grimoire, there are a lot better ones than the Goetia. The Goetia is like the, it's basically, I don't know, what's the best way of explaining it? It's basically like all of like the shit parts of the other traditions. That somebody just got together and just like chucked into a book and yeah this kind of works and then just kind of put it out you know like there's no real logical structure to it there's no there's no real like authentic i mean there is a tradition to it it is part of a wider tradition and it also depends on which manuscript of a goetia that we talk about you know um i they're like the the version that Mathers and Crowley translated is from a specific manuscript, and, and you could argue that's its own thing. Um, and generally, what people define as goetic is if it contains those seventy-two spirits, right? So that that list of seventy-two spirits that largely derives from Weyer the, and then probably the Libra Malorum. Um, so we have other ones, something like the Goetia Dr. Rudd, which Stephen Skinner has done um, great work on, which I think is slow. I can't remember the exact manuscript number. It's like three something. Um, and Dr. Rudd's Goetia is, is far more uh, elaborate, far more advanced. It, it, it contains the, the corresponding verses to the Shemeh Mephrash angels, which is a vital part of the whole process anyway. You need to invoke the angel before you summon the demon. That's what gives you the power to summon it in the first place. Um, but what's inevitably happened with this whole thing is because that's kind of the main text that everyone initially reads, everyone kind of thinks that's it. 
you know, that that's ceremonial magic. And then no one reads the European sort of mono traditions. No one reads the French or the German ones um, or any of the other things. And people think, oh, well, you know, that's, that's, that's the only kind of ceremonial magic you can do. Like, no, there's, there's planetary magic. There's medieval angel magic. There's work with elementals. There's working with the Olympic spirits. There's, there's hundreds of different kinds of ceremonial procedures you can do, none of which are related to the Croatia. Uh, so my issue with the glacier is not so much what's in it, because what's in it is is effectively just kind of like, you know, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel of the ceremonial procedure, effectively. Um, it's more just what people think of it, and people get so defensive of it. You know, they're like, oh, the Goetia is so perfect, you can't critique the Goetia at all. It's like it's almost considered heretical to critique the Goetia. Um, and I, I will fully die on this hill. I'll be like, no, the Goetia, the Goetia is, is not... Like at all what people think it is. You know, please read some other grimoires. Like the um, Trithemius, for example, right? Trithemius's angel scoring or the art of drawing spirits and crystals is a far easier and a far more substantially developed practice than the Goetia. It's mm. far it's far simpler to do. Um and and a large and even then, right? The the Theagia Goetia, right? So the second book of the Lesser Key of Solomon is effectively the first book of Trithemius' uh, Stenographia, right? It, it, somebody basically just took it out of context or sort of plastered it onto the end of the Ars Gravatia. Because uh, if you think of what we, what we call the Lesser Cure Solomon, it's basically five, five or four or five different texts that somebody basically just chucked into a book together, none of which have really that much to do with each other, you know? So you have the Ars Gravatia, which is the first book, which is kind of its own... You know, it's its own system, its own tradition there. Um, and then you have the Theurgia Goetia, which is the second book, um, and something like the, the Ars Paulina, right? Now, the Theurgia Goetia is the first book of Trithemius' Stenographia, and, Trithem- and Trithemius is, is the mentor of Agrippa, and he has this whole thing of drawing spirits into crystals and all that kind of thing. It's all very, very good. Um, Ars Almadel is another, is another one that's often put in there, and that's, that has some other... And that, that's the one where you've got to have a wax tablet and, on, and a working table where, again, you draw spirit into things. Um, and this is this is something that people often uh, mistake when, when you're putting into practice, especially if you read the grimoire. Um People have the impression, you know, when you're summoning a spirit or whatever it is, the spirit's just going to appear in front of you like a like a physical person. You know, it's like mm, not that's not really that's not really what it says in the grimoire. You know, like it, it's much more common for you to invoke or evoke the spirit into a mirror, so like it invoke it into something. Trithemius invokes them into crystals, or he evokes them rather into crystals, so the spirit will appear in a crystal uh, or an obsidian scrying mirror. Um, Rudd uses, uh, I think he he places it on the brass vessel, uh, and he also uses like the the, the glass receptacle. So he, he puts kind of like a fluid condenser into a into a, a glass thing that the spirit then manifests in. Um, but there are lots of different ways for how the spirit manifests. Very few of them are, are like physical manifestations that you see, like an actual person on the other, on the other side of the, the circle, whatever it is. Um, and again, all the other systems are far easier to use. They're, they're far more developed than the Goetia. Um, but people just like the Goetia a lot because of Crowley. You know, all it's kind of the big famous one. You see magic circles plastered all over um all over eBay and all over YouTube, whatever it is. And magic circles are another weird thing. Like the version of the magic circle that we know from Crowley, you know, with the Hebrew and the snake around it and the triangle, whatever it is, that is extremely late. It's a very late state addition um, to to the whole system. It's like 1600s, 1700s, whatever it is, um, and it's it's also kind of weird because the the older traditions, especially you go back to something like the Heptameron or the Lucidarium uh, Nigromantiae, the circles change. You know, you don't have one one consistent circle the entire time. Yeah, you, know, you you went like the names and the sigils that you carve or you draw around the sides of the circles it changes with the hour that you perform the operation. It also depends what season you're working in. Uh, it depends what hour you're working in, what day, what astrological forecast it is. You know, you need to, you need to put different things. So like usually, I, I can't remember the exact order of it, the heptameron circles are like, you have the name of the hour uh, and or the day, then the angel that rules the day, or the angel that rules the hour, then the angel that rules the day, then it's sigil, then 
the around the side you've got the names of the governors of the air or the winds uh and then the name of like the earth in whatever season it's in because the name of the earth changes depending on the seasons the name of the sun the name of the moon again they also change depending on the seasons and then also the name of the season that you're in and some of them most of them are also hebrew names for things but um the point is the circle is not one consistent thing it changes depending on like what hour you're performing the ritual then right so you need to consecrate it or create it every time uh, at least in the earlier grimoires it isn't until you know quite late in the whole tradition that we get a sort of a consistent circle that stays all the way through that we like so you, you you know you have the same names going all the way around and even then the, like the names and the things that we have on crowley's circle they're not even ceremonial they're all kabbalistic right they're all they're all they're, they're mostly from kabbalah you know it, it, it's from i think it's what echea to levaya or whatever it is and you go through i think it's it's east i think around the south area of the circle if, like, if i'm picturing it correctly you have like echea chesar metatron whatever it is right so they're all jewish kind of kabbalistic names they're not even necessarily uh, like, you know, ceremonial or ritual names um and again all of that kind of comes from again the golden dawn was very kabbalistic in its own way they have they were very into their hermetic kabbalah as well um but some of it comes from the original uh the original stuff as well but it's it's just a very strange uh a very strange procedure but a lot of my uh a lot a lot of my practice again takes a lot more from something like trithemius you know like his art of drawing spirits and crystals is probably one of the easiest um systems for, for working with spirits i think probably uh among other kinds of uh general evocations or whatever it is you know other than that most of my work is, is pgm so it's all pre stuff because the definition of croatia has changed hugely i mean we can get into this maybe a little bit later um but someone like jake sharp and ken has done a huge huge amount of work on the greek folk magic origins of croatia it's originally a necromantic practice uh before it was applied to demons uh, that we can attribute the application to demons mostly to early theologians, mainly Augustine and Isidore of Seville in his encyclopedia, um, because he kind of equates demons. Um, well, it's kind of a weird long story. He ends up, I, I think it's Isidore in his encyclopedia. Um, he has this idea that, you know, he, he, he keeps hearing this, this theory that, you know, people or magicians are summoning the dead, you know, or they're summoning their ancestors or they're summoning um you know past past spirits or past prophets or whatever to, to seek advice whatever it is uh and he makes the claim that you know only only god can truly raise the dead so these people they can't you know clearly they can't be talking to the dead because only god can raise the dead surely so therefore it must be a demon you know dis disguising itself as as a dead person you know so that then sort of shifts the meaning of something like necromancy yeah, and it, it becomes what we call necromancy in the Middle Ages, which is called the black art. Um, but that's kind of how this how the system gets conflated ultimately. Um, but yeah, Goetia was originally Greek folk magic. It had nothing to do with demons. Yeah, it, it had it was most like a chthonic, uh, as in underworld stuff, uh, very much from the Greek uh, tradition. And James Tran Kent's done a lot of work on that, so it's very interesting stuff. But. I wonder how much H.P. Lovecraft was aware of that, because as you said. You know, these things happen in cycles. H.P. Lovecraft yeah. writes about the old ones, and and then yeah. I forget who was it, LeVay comes out and publishes, or a group of occultists publish uh, the Necronomicon that now is kind of famous on the Barnes & Noble yeah. shelves for being the, the evilest book that you could buy a, at a Barnes & Noble. Yeah. <laughs> Lovecraft, Lovecraft has had, d d despite... You know, despite him himself having actually a very limited knowledge of the occult, he he does he really doesn't seem to have really any sort of substantial knowledge outside of pulp fiction. Um, he was never initiated. He was never you know a part of any magical order or occult order, as far as we know. Um, he had a very limited knowledge of the occult. Uh, he had an amazing imagination, absolutely. Uh, but he has become one of those interesting figures who, despite having no like core knowledge of the occult, he's been picked up by a lot of modern authors, and he massively influenced the modern occultist scene. Um, so something about the Necronomicon. Uh, so Lovecraft's original Necronomicon, there is a working theory, I can't remember who says this, um, that no, uh, Lovecraft maybe based his, his idea for the Necronomicon on the Picatrix. Uh, which is the one of the early Arab astrological grimoires. Um, 
Because again, if you think about there are some similarities, the Picatrix claims to be this kind of old book of Arab wisdom. Ultimately, the Necronomicon is written, of course, by, uh, what's the name, Abdullah Al-Halazeb, which is the mad Arab, right? Um, and it, 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 the Picatrix is this grimoire for drawing down astrological forces, you know, from planets and, and spirits of the planets and that kind of thing, which again are celestial objects. They are from space. You know, the planets are in space. The Picatrix is a grimoire of drawing down astrological power. And the old ones, you know, or the Necronomicon, or the old or in in the Necronomicon, the old ones are described as cosmic space entities, right? So there are similarities here. So there is a, a strong, I would say, it's a strong chance. People may not agree with me that Lovecraft based his idea for the Necronomicon on the Picatrix, um, which itself is a very interesting text. Um, but yeah, you you get things like the Simon Necronomicon, which was published in like the seventies or the eighties, um, and we do know who the author was. The author, like the guy's name's not Simon. I can't remember. One of my friends told me recently. I can't remember the dude's name. Um, but there was actually a funny mix-up. It was in, it was in like the nineties, whatever it was, when, when the copyright for the book got renewed or something like that. Um, the the real author's name got put on the new copyright. So we actually found out who it was. Um, and he's kind of a weird dude. Actually, I can't, I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, but he's quite a weird guy. Um, but I have a, I mean, I, I have a bit of a different sort of opinion to maybe other practitioners when it comes to the Necronomicon because, as far as as far as the the backstory everything goes, it, it's complete bullshit, right? As far as that goes, like the you know the like the Necronomicon or, or the Simon Necronomicon, uh, yeah, it, it's I can I can promise you all right now, it's it's not a, a black book of Sumerian magic about old ones or elder gods, whatever it is. No, it was written in the, in the 80s or the or the 70s, whatever it was. Right. And it's based largely on mixing HP Lovecraft stuff with some Kabbalistic stuff and a lot of Crowley stuff. Uh, and I think, yeah, you are right. Um, I think LeBay mentions some of the old ones and things in, in the in the Satanic Bible as well. And he, he he drew a lot from Lovecraft there as well. Um but it's a uh, I don't know the the Simon Necronomicon, the thing with it, which is really weird, is I I still haven't quite figured it out. I always, I always kind of took the opinion that they, they were all just thought forms. You know, they were all kind of egregores in general, all like all, like, all like the watchers or whatever that I talked about in there. They're not any because it doesn't have any historical value necessarily. The backstory isn't true. I always just kind of assumed that they were thought forms, they were egregores. Um, but the system works. It is a it is a workable magical system, and if you do it, you will get results with it. So, like, regardless of whether the backstory is real, the system does work, you know, and whether you are calling on those entities that he's talking about in that book or not, or whether you're calling on something else, I don't know. Um, but the system does work. So I don't, I don't usually mess with it anymore. Like, it, it's not really a system I particularly like. I enjoy it. I prefer my, Egypt, my Egyptian and Greek stuff, personally. But um, I, I had quite a good, quite a powerful experience uh, with the, what's it called? Towards the end of the book, you have the 50 names of Marduk. And there is a name, I, I can't remember which number it is, one of the names in there, it's supposed to excite rainstorms or cause rainstorms. Um, and sort of when I was initially, this would have been, I was what, 17, 18, this was like, you know, many, many years ago, um, when I was like still in college, whatever it was. I attempted it. I, I, I sort of followed the whole ritual procedure uh, with the 50 names of Marduk, and I sort of invoked the name, did the whole thing, and it was, and it, it worked effectively. You know, I, it was a completely clear night. You know, I, I was in London at the time. Uh, it was a completely clear night. There was no clouds. There was no wind. There was nothing. And within about, I don't know, five, six minutes performing ritual, it, there was a full blown thunderstorm like outside um and it, it just worked and, and as quickly as i had performed it and it had started about 10 minutes later it just stopped you know it's like from a completely clear weather no cloud in the sky no record on, on you know the weather forecast whatever it was anything synchronicity like that i'm like yeah this system works you know so so it does work the stuff does work um and I'm also like I I also did a, a very minor path working through the the Necronomicon gates there. So if you, so if you know the text, some people who know the text, obviously they have a selection of gates that he talks about how you can sort of travel to the realm of the old ones uh, through these gates that you kind of inscribe on the ground or look into or whatever. 
Um, then I did a couple of those where I, I you know, painted the, the gates and so all the symbols from the gates on the floor in chalk or paint, whatever it was in my apartment at the time. Um, got the oil lamps, did it at the astrological time. And I ended up having some very macabre, strange visions about shit. Like it was, it was, it was you know, equivalent what I will, what I would say it was comparable to like when I was on like a low dose of psilocybin, but I was completely sober. Um, but I did have quite, you know, quite visionary experience with that book. So, and it was, it was again, it was one of my early, my early occult grimoires. You know, it was one of the first ones I got into. Um, so I think most people generally, as as a whole, if I if I was to kind of generalize to people, generally people will get into magic probably through Wicca. Usually, like that's how most near or any kind of neo pagan stuff comes through. Um, where they'll come in as a neo pagan, they'll then maybe get turned on to someone like Crowley or maybe into Golden Dawn stuff. Uh, and they'll get interested in Golden Dawn, they'll start doing the Golden Dawn practice. Uh, or maybe through the Golden Dawn, they'll find Crowley, they'll go into Thelema. And then from Thelema, they'll go into ceremonial magic and the Solomonic stuff, the Grimoires. And then eventually, you know, you kind of just keep going back and you find a niche you like, you know, whatever kind of magical system you enjoy. Or they'll come in through the Necronomicon and then they'll eventually find something, uh, something else. And uh, I, while I, while I, I didn't come into Necronomicon, I, I came in more again from the academic side because I, I came into it because I, I was studying this from in or in university. I was studying magic and studying history, uh, history and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's kind of a weird thing because like my initial interest in the whole thing was actually purely academic. Like I, yes, I had always kind of believed in stuff like this. Um, but when I initially started practicing it, especially from the grimoires, I initially kind of took the approach of, okay, well, I'm going to kind of take an academic curiosity approach to this. Like I'm studying this time period. I'm studying these texts, you know, I'm, you know, it, it was very kind of like a weird, like dark academia movie moment for me. I was kind of like, I, I was like up late. I was in the library by myself, you know, studying some ancient manuscript at the museum. Uh, and it was talking about, you know, that I was, a, I was studying some Solomonic manuscripts or whatever it was uh, in, in the British Library at the time when I was in London. Uh, and I was working late, that kind of thing. You know, you can kind of imagine and visualize it. It was, you know, raining outside, there's a little storm going on, you know, the moon shining. I'm kind of sitting here reading this old manuscript where people are talking about demons or they're talking about summoning with all these different circles, like magic circles, whatever. And yeah, I'm studying the period. I, I was largely studying it from a, like a linguistic perspective and also just from like a general historical context. And yeah, there was a, there was absolutely a part of me that was like, you know what, like they're basically giving me like step by step instructions here. Like, I'd be kind of an idiot if I did if I wasn't at least curious to see if it worked. Like, if I followed the instructions and like see what would happen, and then I did, and stuff started happening. <laughs> so I was like, ah, shit, this stuff works. Okay, interesting. Um, so then from there, I kind of just I just started tracing my lineage back, you know, so I tracing my lineage back and eventually I, I landed in, in the Greek magical papyri, which is now what the focus of my practice is, you know, we construct in Greek magical papyri. So it's, it's an, yeah, it's a whole interesting thing, but yeah, like going back to the original thing, Lovecraft, um, yeah, L Lovecraft has a, has a huge influence on it. And, you know, there are people like Kenneth Grant, who is, is part of the, who he was, was part of the Typhonian order um and all that kind of thing and he is he is very much under the impression that lovecraft was kind of this tortured prophet you know that he was kind of communicating with you know some extra dimensional being or some extra dimensional things who were using him as kind of a vessel to speak through uh and there is kind of a magical system there um i i can't speak to it i i haven't worked with the lovecraft system you know i i generally take the view that they're thought forms uh but i also know that is a detached perspective you know, I, I haven't worked the system so i don't know it like i generally think they're thought forms but I have no idea. You know, I, I know there are people, I know other magicians who I've worked with who swear by it. You know, people were, um, back in the day, someone like S. Ben, uh, S. ben Payne, for example, he he wrote the entire Lovecraftian grimoire, you know, the Black Book of Asathoth. Um, and, and he he swears by the whole system. Uh, that it, it's a, you know, it's a valid thing. These, these are, I think the way he describes it is that he, he was path working uh, the Tree of Life one day, or perhaps, or perhaps the Tree of Life, the Tree of Death. Uh, and he gets the kind of da'af, you know, the, the sephira in between. And supposedly he discovered these entities, you know, inside of da'af, all inside the sphere of da'af, that are essentially consistent with Lovecraft's mythos. 
And then he kind of wrote the whole grimoire around working with those entities that he found. It's it, it's an interesting grimoire. I haven't tried it. I haven't attempted it. I have no real reason to work with the Clithoff or or anything like that because my life's pretty fine. <laughs> you know, I have no, I have no reason to invoke that energy into my life. Um, but you know, if, if people were interested in it, they probably can, uh, and they will get results, I suppose. But it's it's an interesting debate. So, yeah, and, and that's I'm glad you said that because that's something that I think is important to highlight is. You know, these are tools or techniques, as we were establishing earlier. It's not something that's going to to work uh, if you overuse it, right? It's something that's specific to specific yeah. needs. Now, hmm. when it comes to Solomonic magic, you mentioned earlier it's kind of like a composite where the authors would take several other writers and put them all well, in the, the goetia is not oh, all okay. not all solomonic not all solomonic magic so we have uh like the the lamegiton which to the lesser key of solomon uh is its own kind of you know own tradition it's its own little bubble of things which is is very kind of loose and very kind of everyone's throwing stuff together the lesser key of solomon is not the only kind of solomonic magic we also have things like the the veritable key or the greater key and the general clavicular tradition, clavicular is Latin for key. Um, and that is very popular throughout Europe. It's very popular uh, through in mainly in France and Germany, those kind of places. Um, and that is a much, much more developed tradition uh, that has a much more kind of more established tradition or more established history that can trace more or less linearly back to the magical treaties of Solomon, which is the Hagramantia, uh, which can potentially, I mean, Stephen Skinner has argued that uh, it, it traces back, I think, uh, he argues that the, the Hygromant here is the missing link between the PGM, so the Greek Magical Patari, and the early sort of Italian um, yeah, Solomon things. Because the thing with it, like, like, the way Stephen Skinner kind of tries to, and I, 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 want to this, I don't fully agree with him on this, it, I want to say he has hypothesized, he has not proven. Uh, even though, as much as I love Stephen Skinner, uh, and everyone does, he has. it is a hypothesis, it is not a proven fact. Um, he yeah, hypothesizes that the PGM leaves Alexandria or leaves Thebes and one day Luxor, travels with kind of the Greeks back to Byzantium, which is Constantinople, the modern day Istanbul, where he claims that the um, the High Grammantia is written, uh, which is around the Byzantine Solomonic Grimoire, like all the collection of Byzantine manuscripts that are Solomonic. And then when the Ottomans sack Constantinople, the Byzantines move to their stronghold in Italy, and they bring that manuscript tradition with them, which then brings Solomonic tradition to Europe, uh, effectively. And um, it's like there is some evidence for it, mainly because a lot of the kind of the Italian Renaissance begins in Florence. I mean, it, it began in Florence, kind of expanded out there, and Florence also is the heartbed of necromantic grimoires. There are a lot, especially at the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. Florence seems to be ground zero for a lot of weird grimoires, especially necromantic ones. Um, but I mean, we have we have a was it um, MS uh, PLT or Pluton something? Uh, the the Medici Codex, right, or the, or the Florentine Codex. There we have a there is a necromantic manual or a, a manual of necromancy in the Medici Library. Uh, so they you know, they were very kind of into this whole uh, into this kind of stuff. Um, and from Florence, things seem to spread outwards into the rest of Europe, mainly France and Germany. Um, part of the reason, like, I, I, it's a very kind of, it, it's very good to kind of see that general progression. Personally, I don't agree with um, Stephen Skinner's dating for the Hygromantia. He seems to think it's based off like a seventh century uh, manuscript. It reads an awful lot like an early medieval manuscript, more than it does a Byzantine one. Um, at least to me, uh, I'm, again, I, I'm not gonna contradict or anything like that. But like, like that's my personal opinion. I think it, like the I don't I don't think the Hygromantia is uh, as old as he says it is. I think it's more early medieval. Um, but yeah, like he 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 has done a very good job at, at tracing that tradition. Either way, you know, it's very interesting. And I do agree with him that I think the PGM is the ultimate source of the Solomonic manuscripts. Ultimately, um, but. There are a lot of them, you know. So whether you are whether you are looking at the Hygromantia, uh, which is, which is the magical treatise of Solomon, which is he argues the Byzantine grimoires or Byzantine Solomonic, um, and 
or, or you're looking at the early Italian ones, the French, the German ones, any of that kind of tradition, they have a much more established Solomonic tradition that traces back to the magical treaties and some of the earlier Solomonic texts, more so than the lesser Kia Solomon does. Um, so you kind of, yeah, you need to, we need to kind of expand our horizons when we're talking about Solomonic magic, uh, because the Goetia, like, people, and this is one of the issues we have, people kind of conflate the terms a lot. They say Goetia means Solomonic, or Solomonic means Goetia, or that the lesser Kia Solomon is all the Solomonic tradition. It's like, no, you have Goetia, which is its own sort of self-contained thing, right? That initial Ars Goetia book. And then even then, Goetia is its own other practice which dates back to greek necromancy um in fact i think there is again there is linguistic evidence in greek because goetia obviously comes from the greek word goes which means sorcerer uh, and goes itself is linked to the other greek word goals which is, is a kind of evocative funerary lament ultimately um so it, it, was, it was very closely associated with funerals or funerary laments in general um but you have that tradition, which kind of becomes the Ars Goetia eventually. And then there's the Lesser Kia Solomon tradition, which is basically the term for just people throwing a bunch of shit together. And then you have the Greater Kia Solomon, or the Veritical Kia, or the Clavicular tradition, which is the more kind of established European traditions of these things, which is kind of the deeper Solomonic tradition, which date back to things like the Hygromantia uh, and, and all these other kind of interesting Solomonic grimoires. Yeah, and the Ars Moetia, by the way, the, 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 the Ars Motoria, rather, has nothing to do with any of it. That's the completely separate thing. <laughs> right. Jeez. I'm really grateful you're here to sort it out because it does get complicated. and It's kind of crazy, yeah. Well, believe it or not, I've come across a couple of these books, and one thing that I noticed about the even the Goetia, but other books labeled as Solomonic magic, is it did feel, and now after saying what you, you told me, it does kind of make sense, did feel like a little bit incoherent or unstructured. And I get yeah. that could be the result of somebody taking other authors and just kind of pasting them together in, you know, chapter order. And you're reading through it, expecting it to be like a normal structured book. And it's not, it's like, okay, one chapter is done onto another book. Like here, here yeah. you go. Like, Different you author. No, like there's no way like you're, you know, people make the assumption that the chapters are in the right order. Mm, right. Like, they're, they're, they're not either. It's like, and we, we have the same thing with, um, with Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy, mm. you know. Um, so Agrippa canonically writes the three books. He, there is a fourth book of occult philosophy that is attributed to him, but it's pseudo Agrippian, so it probably wasn't written by him. Um, but whoever wrote the fourth book of occult philosophy basically did the same thing. And they, they basically sort of looked at the Heptameron, especially, and just threw the Heptameron in. And then they also threw in, uh, was it? Oh, they, it's not, they, is it Dane Carla through the day? I can't remember what it is. The other, or, or on the Vanity of the Arts and Sciences, the other one that Agrippa wrote. They also threw that into the back end of it. They also throw in some stuff uh, from, from some other general grimoires and their daily things. But the fourth book of Cock Philosophy is, is the same thing. Basically, somebody just kind of looked at a huge amount of whatever magical material was available during their day. And yeah, let's just chuck it all in a book. It's fine. Whatever. So it's like, and like the weird thing with it, like it, it is useful because like, it, like, it's one of those weird things where like you have like four or five books just like put into one single book. So rather than buying all four, you can just buy that one. Right. It, it makes, it makes like reference a lot easier. Um, but if you try and read it as like a whole like lineal thing, it's just ridiculously confusing and disjointed. And the reason being is that it's like three or four books in one. And there's like, they were all kind of thrown in, in the wrong order mm. as well. And again, it, it hurts the sense of progressionism as well like we said at the beginning yeah well yeah i certainly feel victim to some of the modern conscious you know f uh, biases and especially when you confront the way people thought hundreds even maybe thousands of years ago depending on what you're reading but yeah thank you i appreciate it disjointed is the right word for some of the books i've read in this realm now when it comes to uh Solomonic magic. One thing that I've noticed through my own research into local esotericism here in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale University happens to be, I noticed mm. that there is a nine square grid 
that the whole city was plotted around. So the original colonists, founders, they drew this nine square grid. The original town looked like that, and the city's expanded ever since. And they, unlike most other American cities, they preserved that uh, city zoning and planning where in other places, you know, they're just like, whatever, we'll just re-carve the roads and make them in a more efficient way, right? Whereas here, they're like, no, we have to con- we have to conserve this nine square grid. It's special. And I, I read, I believe it was, um, oh, I, I forget his name now, but uh, another, another author who's written uh, about England quite a bit. Hmm. Um, he mentioned that there are these same nine square grids in some English towns. And I'm wondering, does this have anything to do with Solomonic magic? Because that was something I came across. One of the theories that people purported online is, oh, you know, this is Solomonic magic because Solomon used the proportions of a human to create a temple and yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Are there any connections with, you know, building, planning, architecture, that sort of thing? I wouldn't say it's it's inherently Solomonic. There is sort of precedence for, for that kind of thing in astrological magic. So something like uh, so so the the ninth century Islamic city of Baghdad, for example, was founded astrologically. So all the astrologers, when they were founding the city, they got together to elect a specific time and a specific place to plan the city out and build the city so that it would be prosperous essentially that it would be you know the best kind of way and they did sort of lay it out according to an astrological geometry essentially uh and that's also something that appears in the picatrix as well there is kind of the fabled city of hermes that is kind of a lost city in the desert um but supposedly every single building was constructed astrologically or it was uh, constructed to kind of mirror certain stars in the heavens or in the certain, or certain planets at specific times um and effectively what you're doing in, in that kind of, you know, if you're doing that kind of thing, if you're, if you're doing any kind of city planning, you're essentially making a, it, it's, it's essentially an astrological talisman, right? It's the same process. You're just making an astrological talisman that's like a thousand kilometers wide, you know, like an entire city wide. So you have an entire, basically a, a receptive battery that just absorbs the astrological influence of whatever time you're doing it. So if you, if you fire, found a town at the right time, you basically have like a 1,000 by 1,000, 2,000 by 2,000, however big your city is. You have a, a, an enormous freaking astrological talisman that makes for a very, very powerful city, you know, a very, very prosperous city. And it's why Baghdad becomes one of the most prosperous cities in the ancient world because it was founded astrologically. Um, well, and it does seem like... It, do, it does Stone. seem like Stonehenge and the pyramids with their alignments and all the other megalithic structures, it, it seems like they've refined that process to make it so subtle that people don't even notice that they're standing mm. in a astrologically, geometrically aligned city. Yeah, part, partly. So there is, I mean, the pyramids are always a weird one. There are, there are obviously a lot of conspiracy theories like, <laughs> yes. things about, the, about the pyramids. Um the honest, the honest truth is, again, we 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 still don't know, you know, like like we have a very very solid idea, and you know, I I am as an archaeologist, I am partial to the ramp theories, I am partial to all the kind of things, you know, we know slaves did not build them, um, aliens did not build them, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, and the part, the whole thing with the pyramids is always an interesting one. The reason um, that the whole kind of ancient aliens theory stuff doesn't really stack up is it doesn't really account for the experimentation that occurred in the pyramids, especially Snefru, right? So one of the early pharaohs the, uh, of, of the, I think it's the fourth dynasty, um, the guy who effectively kicks off the pyramid building age. They didn't, you know, there, there is this kind of weird perception when it comes to the Egyptians and the pyramids that they kind of just woke up one day and just suddenly knew how to build pyramids, that somehow like someone gave them the knowledge and they suddenly like figured it out overnight, right? It's like, no, but the, the, the Giza complex that we see is the result of about four or five generations of refinement there, right? So you have Snefru, who is, is the original founder of the fourth dynasty or one of the, I can't remember the exact dynasty he's founder of. Um, but he kicks off the building program and he builds the equivalent or he builds effectively three or four different pyramids and or he builds four i think i can't know how it is but he builds the pyramid that he yields may doom then he builds the no, he, so he builds three pyramids uh and the first two of them are complete disasters he just messes them up completely right so first of all he builds the pyramid of may doom and 
clearly whatever happened at Maydoom, they they botched it so badly, whether it's a limestone issue, whether it's a material issue, but the thing collapsed while they were building it. And they just like it, it collapsed so badly that they just left it. They're like, you know what, there's no salvaging this, like we're just gonna leave it. And if you go, it's still there, right? It, it, like they, they basically a square pyramid and then the ins like the, the roof is basically just caved in. Now you can see it's completely collapsed. Then it's like, okay, cool. That went wrong. What went wrong? Okay, we did all this wrong. Okay, let's build the next one. So then they go and build the bent pyramid of Dashur. Right. So they and this time they start with two steeper gradients. So they start going up, and about halfway up, they realize that they've messed it up. So they turn the angle inward and then they keep going upwards. So it ends up with a pyramid that kind of goes straight and then inwards and then up. Right. And then finally, and that but bear in mind, this takes, you know, 50, 60 years. You know, this is this is an, a generation of time that is being refined. And then eventually they finally build the red pyramid, which is the first successful pyramid. And then when they get that blueprint down after a generation or so of work, then all of his grandsons and all of his sons who are from the same family, obviously, they all just copy them. So he and all of his architects basically spent, you know, 60, 70 years refining the process and knowing how to do it. And then when they finally got it done, then everyone just copied him. And it's like, it's also just a weird thing because they didn't stop with the pyramids either. You know, after the fall of the old kingdom, the whole point of a pyramid is, is to centralize kingly power. You know, it, it, it's a mortuary cult, actually, for the dead pharaoh. Uh, and, and the entire point of it is, is, is social stratification, right? It, it's to show the power of the king, and, it, and it's to show that he can kind of, you know, do all the kind of thing. And it shows that the king is the center of the worldview, and that all the pharaoh is the center of the worldview. The problem you have is after the fall of the old kingdom, all of the like the centralized power that the pharaoh has gets taken up by nomarchs who are little local governors and they all are, are trying to assert their own power but none of them can really get enough consolidation to actually build like a good pyramid uh so they kind of like people just kind of stop building them not because there was some like loss of of form or a lot of loss of knowledge or whatever they knew how to do it they just didn't need to because the, there was never another stage where the king where the kingly regime was so centralized that they could actually do it but when we get to the middle kingdom people like sneferu and, and, and some of the or not, not sneferu um his name amenahat i think is one of them uh i can't remember some of the other ones some of the early uh, middle kingdom pharaohs they also build pyramids just much much smaller right so they, they build some at least uh i think there, i think there's one at, um there might be one of Lahoon, I can't remember exactly. Um, but they they built some throughout the Middle Kingdom anyway. Um, but there are there are you know other interesting magical theories that you know they are aligned by a planetary cameos or whatever. Um, I haven't really seen anyone that holds a, a huge amount of weight. Um, there is some theory that you know I, I, there is a branch of archaeology called astroarchaeology, which is is looking at the way monuments are aligned to certain star constellations, things like that. And there is some evidence that Stonehenge was aligned astrologically with obviously the winter solstice and summer solstice, um, and all that kind of thing. And, and they do have they have to have a very working knowledge of the cycles of of, of the universe or what cycles of, of the solar system in general to know this kind of stuff. Um, and it's one of those, I don't know, it's one of those things that, like, I, it, it's it's got me accused of being cynical sometimes, which I, I, I'm just settling into at the moment. It's kind of becoming my new identity. Um, just because you can't figure out how they did it doesn't mean aliens did it. It just means they're probably smarter than you. You know, they they knew how right. to do it, right? They figured this shit out. Imhotep, right? Imhotep is the high priest of Ra in Heliopolis. He's the guy, the architect of the first pyramid. Right, he's the architect. This guy was a genius. He is a he is a polymath. He he knew probably knew multiple languages. He is in every sense of the word a complete genius. And he is also one of the only people who whose name we do actually know from from the alchemy you know, because he's inscribed alongside um, Snefru's name, which is very. Old. I think it's Joseph. I think he's the architect of the Step Pyramid of Joseph, uh, actually, and his name is is uh, written alongside Joseph as well. Um, Imhotep is is he was so important that he was eventually deified. In sort of the middle and the uh, middle and the new kingdom, he became a god unto himself. Right, people started worshiping him as kind of the god of craftsmen and a god of healing. Uh, and the Greeks eventually translate him over into Asclepius, and Asclepius is kind of a god of healing. And Asclepius also appears in the Hermetica as well, which is also kind of a surefire influence of, of their Egyptian origin as well, because they're talking about Imhotep, which is itself very interesting.
but they they figured this shit out right they were they were very like egyptians were very very smart <laughs> they knew they knew this stuff yeah. you know it's, it's the same kind of thing well it's it's interesting you just brought to mind another example of this uh astrologically aligned archaeology have you ever heard of the glastonbury zodiac yeah yeah, yeah. It's what like, do you? I, I've been across to me quite a few times. It's quite, uh, it's quite an interesting idea. Yeah. See now, as a as someone who's from the UK, what do you think of that? Is that kind of like our Roswell, where it's like a touristy kind of thing that people go to, or partly? I mean, Glass Glastonbury is is one of those areas. Like, I have two, I have two perspectives on it. Like, it, it's it's one of those things. You go and there is something about the place. You know, there, there is a very definitive energy to the place. Um, it definitely, there is a feel to it, you know, and people, it does draw people. Uh, there are a lot of pagan sites. There are a lot of holy sites, like holy wells, pilgrimage places, the White Spring, the Red Spring, that kind of thing. Um, and the Red Spring especially is is still an active pagan shrine to the goddess, Brig uh, the, the Celtic goddess Brigid. Um, and also there is a, a, a male counterpart there. It's not exactly clear who it is. Um, but you, you, there are, you know, a lot of interesting things about it. You know, people often talk about the Lady of Avalon and stuff there, which is, there's no real, it's very unclear who she actually is, if there was any historical precedent to it. Um, but there is definitely a feel to Glastonbury. There, and people say it's the heart, it's the heart chakra of the earth or whatever it is, which I, I weirdly have, like, through my own UPG, which is you know my own unverified personal gnosis, my own experience, I would probably say that's kind of true. That's quite, that's consistent with my experience at least. But um, I've had very interesting like romantic experiences in Glastonbury with like past partners or whatever. So like that that kind of theme always comes up. Um, but it's also one of those things that because of that, because there is a natural energy there, it does attract a lot of tourists, where it attracts a lot of people and. The kind of people it attracts are, you know, not 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 to be like super mean, but they're kind of like more like classic new age hippies a lot of the time. You know, they like probably like massively stink of like patchouli oil. <laughs> they they I'm like that, that like weird mixture of like patchouli and like bo or whatever, you know. Um, and I don't know, it, it, it's a weird thing. I think there is there is some mystery in that landscape somewhere. Um, I don't think we're ever, I don't think we're at, at a position in our species yet to figure out exactly what it is. Um, there is something to it, you know, and and we do know that like, the whole area was on the water, you know, like back in the Iron Age or whatever. We have Glastonbury Lake Village, uh, and the whole area around Glastonbury Tor was on the water. Mm. Um, so the whole thing was an island, and uh, that, that's kind of where the idea that it is uh, the island of Avalon from the old sort of Arthurian legend or wherever it comes from. Um, the the association between Arthur and Glastonbury is it, it goes back to sort of I think it's like the eleventh century or the twelfth century in the Glastonbury Abbey where the monks kind of claim that he's buried there. Um, it, for, as far as we can tell, it was kind of a tourist story made up by the monks to kind of draw in funds for the monastery that was failing. Um, there's no evidence that he's buried there, but it's yeah, I don't know. It, it's one of, it's 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 one of those places, you know. It it, it does have a feel to it, but I think it is consistently spoiled by the amount of you know sort of pseudo spiritual new age stuff that comes there it will be very kind of commercialized but yeah. there is something to it at least we have that same uh effect here at um at the famous you know woodstock where all the hippies you know and i i, I never experienced it as it was i've only experienced the kitsch of it and the touristy of mm -hmm. it and yeah, there is a, there is a cynicism that I share uh, when it comes to those, you know. Uh, really, it just it's lazy, you know. It's people yeah, who are interested in this stuff. Right. They they yeah. need to just take more of a approach, a uh, serious approach to these matters because they're they're serious. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I respect it. I I think you have uh, all the right to criticize. You don't sound mean at all. Now, when it comes to your very specific interests. How do your folks feel? This is the My Family Thinks Some Crazy podcast. Do you have a, a family who agrees with yeah, your yeah, no, sensibilities um, or? So, well, so they're, they're pretty supportive for the most part. Uh, we have quite a fun dynamic. So uh, my my stepdad is, is largely kind of atheistic, believe it or not. Uh, he, he's very much kind of like, you know, when, when you're gone, you're gone. 
you know, I am only my body, I'm only my mind, whatever it is. Uh, so that always kind of makes for a very interesting conversation whenever we have our thing. Um, my mom is an interesting one. She she kind of teeters between between things. Like she's she's largely supportive of it. Like I, I again, I some I have a, a a ritual room in their house. You know, and then like it, they allow it to exist and they allow it to be there. Um, where if I go home and I visit them or whatever, I can I can have a place for meditation and and ritual work, and they're fine with it. Um, we, I don't know, it, it's one of those things, especially when I was living with them early on, you know, I, and I was doing ritual things happened in the house, you know, a lot of the time. And it, it, it's kind of just become like a running joke at this point, um, where it's, it's kind of funny. Like I, back in the day when I was doing kind of cunning man work, like traditional witchcraft stuff, um, a friend of mine called me in. So yeah, this was this was down in Essex. Uh, I don't know if you know in that kind of area, a like whole old witch country kind of area uh, in all sort of East Anglia in England. Um, one of my friends, he's also a very traditional cunning man uh, around there. He's more trained by his grandmother in that kind of area, which is I'm super jealous of anyway. Um, but uh he, there was a local church in in the parish that he was living at that uh the the, the cemetery there or, or just in general the local church was being plagued by a spirit of some kind you know like it was like a poltergeist or whatever it was it was like violent and aggressive it was like hurt like no it wasn't hurting people but like there were you know reports of like people getting bites and scratches whenever they came to the church or whatever uh and he basically got called in and he did his typical cunning man thing uh of binding the spirit in the jar so it's a very common thing making a witch bottle for protection, but also like a spirit bottle, where it's a very common thing in traditional witchcraft, where if you have a spirit or something that is 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 plaguing you or plaguing your area, you can seal it. You can bind it up in in a bottle usually, like something like 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 putting a genie into a lamp, right? Where through certain rituals, certain procedures, you can bind a spirit into into a, a jar or a bottle, whatever it is, right? Usually a glass bottle, um, and when it's bound it will the jar will do weird things the jar will move on its own it will move around the house it will sometimes steam up uh for, for no apparent cause for inside of it uh any of that kind of thing um but ultimately it becomes a, a servitor right it, it becomes a, a a ally that you can work with ultimately because it's bound right you can draw on it for for energy or draw on it for ritual power or whatever it is um and my friend he happened to have a couple of these things because it's his job to sort of go around seeding stuff it's very fun um so he kind of called me up he was like hey look can you take this one off my hands you know i was like yeah all right why not I'll, I'll 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 come pick it up you know so i picked it up it was it was quite a weird experience having just like a, a spirit in a jar in my car next to me you know on the, on the, on the passenger seat it was quite funny um but i got it home and it, it, it sort of stayed in in my altar room or, or my ritual room um since and or, or in that ritual room ever since i should say um and it's always it, it, it's kind of become a running joke with my mom especially uh she she calls it casper um after the you know the friendly ghost um but it, it has been a consistent thing where like if, if she you know goes to clean the house or whatever the jar does move on its own and like it's like she does like encounter it every now and again or in like different rooms or like she will hear footsteps and knocks in the night from that room whatever where the jar is kind of moving around by itself you know uh and, and yeah initially she was freaked out by it but i explained it to her and she's like yeah that kind of weirdly makes sense but like you know when you're consistently having having experiences like these you know it becomes very hard to deny that they exist right you know um and thankfully I, I was not raised in any kind of you know very conservative christian household where people think i'm like devil worshiping or whatever my mom was always very very open with this kind of thing um so it's it's, it's kind of a thing as, as far as like she she is she isn't a practicing witch or anything she doesn't do her own practice um she meditates every now and again you know i, I guide her meditations or whatever but yeah it's it's she kind of yeah she kind of teaches between everything you know, every now and again. Uh, but she she's seen me do some rituals before where there's been interesting uh, interesting results, uh, and she she always kind of gets a bit shocked by it initially. But then she's like, "Yeah, okay, I've I'm kind of gotten used to this by now. It's kind of just what you're doing and what you're up to." That's you know. Um, but my 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 general kind of perspective on the whole thing, it, it, it works both in my favor and in in my students' favor as well. It's like if I 
with me, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I, I, I relinquished my desire to kind of prove this stuff exists because I, 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 it, it's been proven to me. And, and you know, in my experience, it, it's real enough that it's having an effect in my life and in, in people around me. You know, so I've relinquished that desire to say, oh, I need, I, I need to prove it. You know, I think it's a very narcissistic desire almost um, to prove your world to everyone else. Uh, but my general perspective on the whole thing is I have my system that I work with or I have my systems that I work with. And through my community, through my platform, I think I teach that system to other people and they then go and perform it and they do their thing. And if they get the same kind of results as I do, or it's consistent with the results that I have, then I can say, you know, well, yeah, okay. So this is like someone independent of me. I had no, you know, direct influence with them. I taught them what to do, but I didn't teach them how to do it, you know? then they're getting their own independent results and a lot of them are consistent with me, you know, and we are effectively creating this school for magicians, basically, who are, you know, if everyone's kind of sharing similar results, similar experiences. And then it, and then it just kind of creates that, that generational link, you know, because they will then go on and teach it to somebody else who will have another similar experience and it can eventually kind of trace back to what I was doing. I was like, ah, oh, okay, cool. It's like, it's not all in my head. You know, it's not all like it's not all just me because I taught it to somebody else and they did what I did and they got the same result. You know, they got this, or in the very least, they got similar results that are within the tradition and are similar enough to me to go, okay, yeah, that's something here. You know, it's like it, 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 it's you know, sometimes it's weird stuff or it's astrological stuff or it's grandma stuff, or like some people will, you know, I, I've, I've had experiences where. I've had, if I've been working with a particular spirit or whatever it is, and that spirit has come through to me or manifested and, and I've experienced it in a very particular way or a very specific way. I've had two or three instances now in the past couple of months where some of my students have, you know, I didn't tell them to go and work with this spirit, but they went away, worked with it, and they had the exact same experience or they had the exact same thing or something very, very similar and uh, even down to things like the gender of certain spirits you know if, if a grimoire says okay a spirit is 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 this j it's male or it's female whatever it is and then i've gone and worked with it and it happens to be you know a different gender to what, what the book says i wouldn't tell anyone about that but then one of my students goes away uses the methods that i taught them and they come back and they go you know what yeah well, i don't agree with the book this spirit actually came through this way i'm like oh really <laughs> interesting right okay right. right but it, it's stuff like that you know it's like i i, I kind of i'm trying to establish this lineal descendants really where it's like i'm, I'm creating this kind of generational link um but ultimately it, it's feeding back and the selfish part of me is like yeah this is great it's basically confirming my worldview so it's confirming like my like it, it's confirming i'm not crazy ultimately because people are also having the same experiences or i'm just making or i know i'm making more people crazy like i am apparently if i'm <laughs> if i'm nuts you know i'm just making more people crazy um depends which way you want to look at it i prefer to look at it from the empowered perspective but it works so you know we can make people can change their life improve their life with it ultimately Obviously, yes. And I, I agree. I think that's the better way to see it. I think that's the appropriate way to see it. And it's a, a great way to wrap up this conversation. Uh, tell us more before we do go. How can folks sign up? Uh, I want to sign up. I'd love to have you back on after we have uh, or I have some some lessons and maybe we can go a little deeper. Obviously, yeah, uh, Welsh Stonehenge is also still on my mind. I'd love to talk to you about that. I know we don't have the most time that is a long story you said but uh yeah tell people where should they go i'm going to put all the links in the descriptions but how do people sign up yeah so at the moment uh i i've tried to make it as simple as possible right now so uh we recently just launched a new kind of basically like a private social media platform is the best way you can describe it. But um, we, we launched a new community that is going to be sort of the general home of all of our future courses. Uh, and that is goldenshadowacademy.com. Uh, so you can find us there. That's also on Instagram. Uh, my my personal one, the, 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 the core community is, is Misty, which is uh, my ultimate where I'm currently teaching right now, which you can find at uh, www.misty.co.uk. Um, and I'm, I'm on Instagram as Mr. I official. I'm also on YouTube as well. Same or Mr. I on YouTube. Uh, that also works. Uh, but the way the whole system works, I essentially just have, I have one live training course at the moment. So we meet generally twice a week at the moment on, on a, a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Uh, for uh, On Tuesdays, we do 
sort of live seminar study groups where we go over an ancient text. So we, we, we will look at a grimoire, for example, look at a Solomon a grimoire, and we will go through it page by page and basically break it down. Uh, or we will look at some ancient text like Plato's Timaeus, a philosophical text, whatever it is. We are currently doing Plato's Timaeus, uh, and we will just go through it together, and we will work through it. So that, that kind of establishes the worldview. And then the Wednesday is the main lecture, which is the, the, the methodology, the history, the philosophy, whatever it is, you know, and we're talking about that kind of thing. Uh, and I've been running that now for point plus two years, um, and that's like a monthly, a general monthly membership, whatever it is. Uh, that is ending soon. It's probably going to end by the end of this year. Uh, and then it will become basically like a standalone course. You know, it's basically like two years worth of material, effectively. Um, but I will then kind of split up into independent, like single modules that people can get if they want to. They, they can focus on like specific areas. Because for the past two years, I basically taught everything. So like, if you, like whether it's astrological magic, traditional witchcraft, Solomonic stuff, um, astral projection, energy work, energy healing, whatever it is, like I've covered everything in the course. You know, it's like, like I kind of went into it with the whole philosophy of being like, I want this whole training program to set somebody up in such a way that either they don't have to read any other magical book again, the rest of their life, and they can have an entire practice, or it will set them up with all of the necessary background worldview philosophy materials that they, that they, they can then go and read any book and understand it mm. and then incorporate it. You know, that that's kind of the general philosophy I took with it. Um, so I, I kept seeing it was one of those things. It was like it was formed out, out of a reaction to like all the Instagram courses. You know, you go over Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, you see everyone kind of pushing you know, like going, hmm, learn ritual magic, become a coach for seven dollars, whatever it is. You know, it's like people just constantly keep buying new courses. It's like no, I'm kind of sick of the whole thing. I I want like one single course, very simple that establishes people well enough. You know. Uh, that, that was kind of the idea of it, but you can find all, all the info. That, there's, there's a store page, everything on the website. You can go and sign up there. It's all, all very fun stuff. Uh, I have an active Discord server, but again, most of my since we just started the new platform at Golden Shadow, uh, most of my sort of energy is being put into that because that's also now how I'm building up like a library of grimoires and stuff in there, and also audio books for things like Hermetica and Plato, all that kind of thing um, to work through in general. Uh, so it's that, that, that's kind of how I'm going at the moment. They're, they're my two places, mistide.co.uk and Golden Shadow Academy uh, on or dot, dot com and on, on, on Instagram as well. They're my two home bases. Beautiful. Well, I have all those links. I'm going to share them in the description. I wish I could reach through the computer and shake your hand because this was one yeah. hell of an episode. This is really, I mean, we took a lot of different twists and turns that I wasn't expecting, Chris, and I'm glad Definitely we did. Goes in these kind of things, I'm so. glad we did. I'm glad we did, and I'd love to have you back on. And, uh, Absolutely. And, yeah, you know, folks listening, please follow up with misti.co.uk and learn all of this stuff that Chris has been putting together over the past two years. Clearly, he's been uh, applying it in his own life, so I'm speechless. But I always end each episode with immerse yourself in the moment wherever you are in the now.